uh, different sections. Uh, I'll be following, I think, a slightly different order to what I originally indicated in, in the program, but I will nevertheless be covering all the material that, that I indicated there. So uh, today, um, this morning's lecture, I just wanted to go over sort of just the basics of uh, analog models, not only for gravity, but more in general, I want to talk about some open problems in quantum field theory in curved space times. Okay? And I will first sort of just give a very broad introduction to some of the ideas. I'll start off by giving uh, some, some very specific examples of what we mean by quantum field theory in curved space times. And uh, I think probably you won't recognize the curved space time in these examples that I give you, but we'll, we'll work through those together. And then uh, I want to sort of, uh, in this last part, I'll be focusing attention, I'll be going into quite some detail, or experimental detail, on one specific case, the simplest case, which corresponds to the case of uh, a uniformly expanding material, which could be also a model, for example, for a uniformly expanding uh, universe. But before doing that, I will uh, try and give some a uh, hand weight. So I'm not a theoretician. I'm an experimentalist. So if you have any hardcore theory questions, I'm probably not the best person to ask. But I will try, nevertheless, to try and give you some, let's say, hand-waving maths that will hopefully uh, allow you to understand why a time-varying background, let's call it just a background rather than a space-time, why a time-varying background can give rise, or has to give rise, actually, to photon pair production. And that's the whole, that lies, really lies at the heart of the whole problem, the whole idea behind studying quantum field theory in curved space times. So that's today's lecture. Tomorrow I will be focusing on, uh, on a different uh, example, still quantum field theory in curved space times. I'll be focusing more on the topic of Hawking radiation. So how to make analogs of uh, black holes in the lab, and then how to use these analogs to try and verify the maths that lies behind the idea of uh, Hawking photon pair emission from astrophysical black holes. And then on Friday, I will be uh, talking yet again about a different model uh, based on what are called photon fluids. So, uh, photons don't interact with other photons. And therefore, it would seem a contradiction to talk about a photon fluid because the key feature of a fluid, what is it that makes up a fluid? It's the fact that the molecules in the fluid do actually interact with each other. There's a repulsive interaction that keeps them apart, and then that makes them flow. Yes. Uh, possibly to be verified. I don't think everybody's ever seen that, but the point is that, the, the, so if that, if that is true though, I mean the numbers you're, you're, you're quoting, are, they're too small to be seen on an everyday basis. So uh, what I'm talking about is, is photons that you, you put them together and they do this, okay? So you actually see them uh, creating waves, you see them, um, creating vortices, for example. And so we'll be talking about this. I'll be showing you how you can make this photon-photon interaction actually observable in the lab, and then how you can harness that to create analogs for, for example, uh, spinning black holes. We'll, be, we'll look a little bit at, at that, and we'll look at the concept of what is called Penrose superradiance. And then in the last part of Friday's lecture, I will be using a very similar model uh, to build uh, a, lab, uh, a lab model uh, where we can study the newton schrodinger equation. Okay, and I think you maybe heard people talk about uh, how that equation was originally proposed, for example, by Penrose to study the, sort of the transition from quantum uh, to classical induced by, by gravity. Okay? And then we've got a tutorial on, that's tomorrow evening, Okay. The tutorial, I sent out uh, two files, which I hope you, you've all received. So if you want to, you can read them beforehand. If you're interested, please do. But I will give some time 
during the actual tutorial to read through them. They're, they're very short pieces, it won't take too long. Uh, I want to divide the tutorial into two parts. So one of those, uh, one of those files is sort of a commentary in uh, an, an online journal. And I just want to have a discussion about what the meaning of these analog models is. The second half uh, will be based on the paper that I sent you. Uh, this is Hawking's uh, original 1974 paper where he described how black holes lead to, um, lead to emission uh, of entangled photons. And I just want to have uh, a discussion with you. I want to start off by trying together to identify the key features that I will be illustrating today. So today I'll be illustrating the key features of why a curved space-time or time-dependent medium, more specifically, leads, right, le uh, leads to uh, photon pair production. And I want together to identify in Hawking's paper where he uses that, where he mentions this effect. Okay? And then uh, I want to sort of go through a little bit, not in too much detail. Again, I'm not a theoretician, but I just want to identify where that actually is potentially wrong, and then sort of work through together how, how it's done, how sort of the modern derivation of Hawking radiation works, where that time variation comes into play, and exactly what, what it means. Okay. Okay, good. So um, I think I've already gone, gone through this. So uh, let's start with some examples of what I mean by QFTs, quantum field theory, and curved space times. Now, this example here, Cherenkov uh, radiation, you probably all heard that, that is not necessarily a quantum effect, but I just want to start from here. Uh, when we're talking about curved space times, with, and typically what I'm really referring to is, especially when I'm talking about a lab model, okay, I, don't, I, I don't have access to a real black hole that can curve space time in any significant way. What I'm talking about is systems which are, are either moving very fast, so close to the speed of light or fast the speed of light, or that have some kind of acceleration associated with them. Okay. So the first thing that comes to mind when you say at the speed of light or even fast the speed of light is this Cherenkov effect. Okay. So if you have a charged particle that moves through uh, a neutral uh, medium, the dipoles will uh, sort of reorient themselves as a consequence of this, and you will have the mission of light on what is called this, this Cherenkov effect. But you can also have another effect. So I've indicated sort of this inner region here. It's what I call the anomalous Doppler region. This is another very interesting effect, which is, I think, a lot less known, called the anomalous Doppler effect. Uh, so the people who have really worked on this are uh, Ginsburg and, and Krolov. If you, if you Google anomalous Doppler effect, Together with their names, you'll find, uh, you'll find several papers. And the idea here is that they, they studied sort of what happens to a two-level atom if this is placed in, uh, in superluminal motion. Okay? Uh, and remember, when I say superluminal here, I'm not talking faster than C. It's sufficient to go faster than C divided by N. Okay? So we're, we're in materials here. So superluminal in this context is fine. We're not violating any, any fundamental. And what they found is so a, a standard, uh, stand, so not, as let's say a stationary or slowly moving two-level atom will typically absorb a photon with frequency omega and transition from the ground state to the excited state, or it will relax from the excited state to the ground state and emit a photon with frequency omega. Okay. So, but when, you're, when this same atom is moving at a superluminal speed, you have exactly the opposite. It will transition from the excited state to the ground state, and it will absorb an, uh, a photon, or it will, it will pass from the ground level to the excited state and emit a photon, okay? Um, so, and as far as I know, this is an effect that actually has never been, been directly observed. Then we have, I've already mentioned this, Hawking effect. So I, I don't know if you're familiar. We will go into, into more, the, to this in more detail uh, tomorrow about Hawking radiation from astrophysical black holes. But from the point of view of these analog models, uh, what you have is you have some kind of, um, 
you have some kind of condensed matter system where you create a perturbation which moves at essentially the speed of light, or if it's in a BEC, it would be at the speed of phonons in, in the material. And you have to, what you need is you need to create a horizon. And that horizon is usually identified as the transition from a subliminal to a superluminal, from subsonic to supersonic uh, flow speeds in the medium. Okay? So you, what you need now is you don't just, in the previous two examples, I had something moving at constant speed. Now I need something that actually has a velocity gradient. As you do in a black hole, okay, in a black hole, it's space, what is creating the flow is space, which is being sucked in uh, by the gravitational field towards the center of mass, okay? And you have this transition from superluminal or subluminal to superluminal uh, flow speeds of, uh, of space itself. So when you have this transonic or this, uh, this transition from sub to superluminal, you have what is what people call a horizon, and then you have Hawking radiation from, uh, from this horizon here, okay? And there are, this is one of the areas where sort of the field of analog gravity has historically been focusing 99% of its efforts, okay? Everything's been directed to the point that the field of analog gravity itself has essentially become, it's identified with sort of like the study of, So GS here is, um, is supposed, to, I don't know why I used the, the letter GS, but it's usually it's indicated with a, with a kappa, with a K. It's just the acceleration at, at the horizon. Okay? So it's how steep the transition is from sub to superluminal. So the temperature scales, the steeper this transition, the higher the Hawking temperature. Okay, so making things a bit more complicated. So we went from uniform speed to speed with a transition from sub to superluminal. We can look at what happens when we have a uniform acceleration, for example, okay? And then we have what is called the fully pulling Davies unruh effect, or usually just called simply the, the unruh effect, whereby you, so you have this, this something, this, this, usually it's considered you have a detector, but the detector can be intended in a very generic sense, which is moving with a constant acceleration, and this will notice the similarity here, this formula with the Hawking formula. I've just replaced the, uh, the, the acceleration across the horizon with the actual acceleration of the object. Okay? And indeed, the two are, are linked. It just depends on your point of view, whether you're an infalling, free-falling uh, observer, whether you're an observer in infinity, or whether you're an observer that's sort of stuck uh, and is locked at a fixed point just outside the event horizon, for example, it means you've got a constant acceleration. And what you will see is that the, the, if you were this detector, you would see the surrounding environment not at zero Kelvin, but at some heated temperature, according to this formula here. Okay? Again, an effect which is lacking any experimental evidence today. Then we can complicate things a bit further, and instead of uniform acceleration, we can consider non-uniform acceleration. So for example, so not something that's just moving in the same direction, but for example, something which is uh, oscillating backwards and forwards. And then we have what is called the dynamical uh, Casimir. Now the first paper uh, talking, they didn't refer to the, they didn't call it the dynamical Casimir effect, but Fulling and Davies in this paper here um, were the first to point out, weirdly, apparently in contradiction with what I was saying here, they were the first to point out that in order to have photon pair creation from an accelerating mirror or object, that acceleration had to be uniform. So um, if you're, let's say, subluminal, and you're moving at uniform speed, you will not excite photons out of the vacuum state. If you're accelerating, you will not excite photons out of the vacuum state. If you're non-uniformly accelerating, then that's, that's the key ingredient required to ex uh, excite photons out of the vacuum state, okay? And there's only an apparent contradiction between these two, because here, 
I said that if you're an accelerated observer, you will see a heated vacuum, which essentially means that you see photons appear out of the vacuum state, okay? But there's a difference in that here, if essentially if I have this mirror which is oscillating in front of me, I will see from my reference frame, which is not the mirror's reference frame, I will see photons appear from the vacuum, okay? Whereas in this case, in order to see this effect, I have to, in order to see this heated vacuum, I have to be in the reference frame. I have to be the accelerated uh, detector, okay? If I'm a distance observer and I'm not in uniform acceleration, I won't see anything. So that's why these two are, are different. Okay, yeah? There you go. So that's the next slide. So... Summarizing, we have uh, sort of all these different effects. I've got sort of the conditions here on, on the speed that is required. Talking about a threshold here, um, this, so this is the answer to your question. This isn't really a threshold, I and mean, there is no threshold. You can start from uniform acceleration to extremely low. You just go back to that formula, uh, which is proportional to acceleration. You'll have some temperature to extremely low. This, what I put in this threshold here, is kind of threshold in order to see a temperature which is of the order of units of Kelvin, sort of 10 to the minus a lot of Kelvins, okay? So crazy accelerations, 10 to the 22 G is what you need. I can't remember how I calculated this, but I think this probably gives you something to the order of a few Kelvin. But it's crazy, crazy acceleration. And this is essentially why this effect has, has never been observed before. Although there is a paper, I think, I don't know if it ever got published, it's definitely on the archive, where there were claims that uh, there are effects possibly related to the Unruh effect where people are looking at the polarization, so the spin of, I think it was electrons in a, in a circular accelerator. And they're seeing that they, they noticed that they weren't perfectly aligning and that this could be explained as due to the fact that they're, from their perspective, the vacuum was heated, and therefore causing them to not, not remain perfectly aligned. But in reality, there's no sort of clear indication, uh, experimental indication. Of this. The dynamical Casimir effect, on the other hand, has had experimental verification uh, using superconducting uh, qubits. I won't be going into the details of that experiment, but it's a paper in Nature from a few years ago by uh, the Chalmers University group led by Per Delsi. So if you're interested in that, I can, I can provide a reference for you. Okay. So the, 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 sort of the main idea that I was trying to uh, give you here is that uh, non-stationary materials or con condensed matter systems can be used to test quantum field theory in curved space-time background. So you can measure photons. Your question is if you can measure particles with mass. Well, it's okay. So if it, it depends where you put the, the emphasis. If your emphasis is on the particle antiparticle, then the two entangled photons are particle antiparticles. The, the weird sort of the peculiarity of the photon is that the photon is the antiparticle of itself. So it doesn't look like might not look like a particle antiparticle pair production, but it is. And, you, and you'll see, uh, I mean, if you go and look, uh, I might tomorrow be focusing more attention on this, but or every time you generate one of these, uh, these photon pairs, you always talk about a positive and a negative difference. So, uh, and we will be going a little bit more detail of that in, in the next slides. And, and those are precisely the particle and the antiparticle. Essentially, the photon... Photons, particle, antiparticle are, are, I mean, they look identical. They are the same, the same photon. So in that sense, part, these, this is particle, antiparticle creation without mass. Now, uh, in order to have it with mass, that's a good question. But I think, the, I mean, the energy is involved, and we have to add that in that mc squared. So the, the energy is involved. The, 
I think the way to look at this is it, it's, it's, not, it's not about... Uh, I think if you sort of limit, even, the way, even when you're talking about photons, if you limit yourself to considering this as a, like a two-level system, and therefore you have uh, absorption or emission, that could be misleading. I mean, the anomalous Doppler effect that I mentioned earlier on, where they do rely on that, is for a very specific case. But in all other cases, really what you're doing is you are um, you're giving energy to the vacuum through the time dependence. And I will go into the details of that uh, in, the next, uh, in the next slides. And that's what it's really about. And, and so the same mechanism, I mean, likewise, and think of Hawking radiation, for example. Um, there people expect sort of in the final phases of the black hole evaporation, it's not just photons, will be emitted, but you will have uh, electron positron pairs, uh, for example, even if there's no two level system. Because that, that's not the mechanism lying at the heart of, of what is going on. So, let me, okay, let me go through the next slides and hopefully that will become, it will become clearer where the energy transfer from the system or from, from, the, from the background comes into play. But essentially that, that's, so very briefly, I think this actually might help as an introduction to what I'm about to say in the next slides. Uh, the, the, the concept is that you, so let's say, say you start off with some potential that describes a system, it's very generically speaking. And then you'll have, I mean, you'll have some excited states, of course, but let's just focus on the ground state. Okay, so this is the, my, my, if you want, my one half h bar omega, but this is just the, the vacuum state, okay? And then I, I take this potential and it's in some backgrounds. Usually people just consider this to be in a Minkowski flat space flat space-time. Let's now assume that I can suddenly change that space-time. So I transition from this potential to I, things are changing, so it would be some other potential. Okay, so I have this transition over here, and then I'll have, I'll go from here to here, I'll have some, some new, uh, new potential. It will, it will look different, okay, so I've changed it. And it's precisely this mismatch. If this happens fast enough, then essentially this level, if you want this, this ground state here, does not correspond to this ground state over here. Okay? I mean, very naively, I could just trace this out. And it actually corresponds to an excited state of my input vacuum. Okay? So if I was to go here and come back again very quickly, I'm transitioning from a ground state to another ground state, and then I'm trying to come back again, but this ground state doesn't correspond to this ground state, and therefore... I'm left with an excited state. But an excited state is precisely telling me, so here I've, I've drawn, this would be three halves, five halves, this would be seven halves, h bar omega. So the final, if I look at my system, it starts in the ground state, pure vacuum, it's gone up and down, come back again, and then I've got photons. Okay? So that's, that is the heart, although it's very naive and hand-waving, but that is the essence of where the energy is coming from. I think you should just see it as, I mean, they're just excitations of a, of a field, right? So whether that field is, has a mass and you're talking about uh, electron and positron, or whether you're talking about uh, photons, it doesn't really make, make much difference. And I, I can evolve the same Klein-Gordon or similar Klein-Gordon equations regardless of whether it's a photon or, or an electron, but I just consider these as fields and I'm just transitioning from one and back again, but the, the, you need enough energy, of course. It's, I mean, and the only requirement here, I mean, I wrote h bar omega, but I mean, you just, just call it E0, and then um, En, okay? It's, it's just energy, and those are just energy levels. It doesn't have to be the harmonic oscillator for the electromagnetic field. It can be any quantizable. 
the mechanism is still the same. Okay, Let, let's go through a bit more in detail the, the, the derivation and hopefully if you, and you'll see that I, although I keep on talking about photons because all the analogs that I'll be mentioning are condensed matter systems that use photons, actually if you, know, if you just re replace the H power omega with E and it doesn't, uh, you, you get exactly the same kind of effect. Okay. So, so, the, the, so, so, so going back to what I was saying here, so the main idea is that, is that you can create non-stationary materials, and we'll come look at that in a bit more in detail later on. And these can be used to sort of mimic or, or study quantum field theories in, in curved space types. Now, the sort of going a little bit of history where all this sort of came from, uh, Burnell, back in 1818, predicted that a moving medium Bags light, for example. This is one of the first studies where somebody actually looked at what happens at the, in, during the interaction between light and the moving, moving medium. This formula here can be very simply derived, for example, from the velocity addition formula, it's the special relativity. Uh, Gordon, in 1923, derived what's called the Gordon metric. Here he was trying to draw an analogy between uh, general relativity, so Einstein's equation and light in a moving medium. He was actually looking at this the other way around. So I'm trying to use light in a moving medium to mimic gravity. He was trying to see if gravity could do the opposite, or could uh, somehow mimic how light behaves in a moving medium. And then in the 50s, for example, Fan Mao Kuam started studying ray optics in moving media. And even in the Landau Lifshitz book, you can find a quote where they, they there's a sort of short caption where they're studying light in moving media, but, it says, they neglect light effects, that's light effects, not light, sorry. So they're, they're neglecting small effects due to the possibility of a velocity gradient. But I just pointed out, you know, if you want to study Hawking radiation or any of those other effects, it's precisely the velocity gradient that you want to look at. And I agree, they are slight, they're small effects, very hard to measure. But these, the, this is where things, I think, become really interesting. Okay, so um, the question then is, how do you actually get a condensed matter system to move at close to the speed of light, or even faster than the speed of light, for that matter? So let's start just from the wave equation in 1D, written out here. And now I can include into this just hand wavingly, but you can sort of uh, derive this properly. You can include the space time uh, uh, due to this varying refractive index. Okay, so I've just taken C and I've just divided it by N and then I flipped it over to this side. But you see, this refractive index now is a function of X and T. Here I've taken a specific dependence, I've said it's a function of X minus theta, meaning that it's moving at some constant speed. Okay? But it doesn't have to be like that. And in the next slide, you'll see something, a, a case where the refractive index depends only on t and not on x. But from this equation, I can just pull out my metric, which is this metric here. Okay? So I've got my, d, I've got my dx squared term, but you see in front of the dt squared term, I have c squared divided by n squared. So this immediately tells you, and this is sort of, this is what is called the Gordon metric, by the way. This is the metric Gordon derived. Uh, this immediately tells you that the properties of my space-time described by this metric are completely determined by this n squared of x minus dt, or in general, n squared of x and t. Okay, so my field here, whatever it is, it's not important. It can be electrons, it can be photons. I'll be talking about light, so I'll just stick with the photons. But it's my field phi sees a space-time metric which is determined by, in this case, I'm talking about photons, determined by the refractive index. Okay, so then the problem of creating a desired space-time metric that I want to study, or space-time background, is, is essentially reduced to the problem of creating a refractive index profile that can mimic this, uh, this space-time. So the first thing you do is say, okay, I want, this is the kind of model I want to, you know, you choose one, the Unruh effect, whatever it is, the Hawking radiation. That's the space-time metric that I want to mimic. You look at the space-time metric, 
you pull out, just by comparing the two, you pull out what the X, N of X and T should look like, and then you have to come up with a way to generate that N of X and T, okay? But how do you do that? Well, the trick that we've been using, and most people working with sort of optical analogs, uh, is to use nonlinear optics to modify the, the refractive index in space and time, okay? So the, the main idea here is that the first order, the polarization, is usually just written as a P of epsilon zero I one times Z, okay? So 99% of Maxwell's equations results sort of are just derived by using this kind of polarization, but actually you can expand that polarization. You can, in general, you'll just have a chi, okay? Gives you the susceptibility, it's a, uh, the susceptibility of your material, and you can expand that in a power series as a function of the electrical field E. So the first order, you have this term. Uh, I have not included the second order term here uh, for technical reasons. So most materials do not have what would be written here as a chi 2, because uh, any isotropic or central symmetric a material does not have a chi 2, so for example, glass, air, uh, water, so all the most common materials. You need very peculiar crystals in order to have a chi 2. Let's just drop that for a moment. Consider the more general case. The next term would be a chi 3 times e squared. Okay? Now, I've purposely written it like this, where I've selected out one of the electrical fields instead of writing e cubed here, because you can see that if I just collect this term here, this is essentially behaving, I can just write that as some effective, uh, some chi effective. And that chi effective, we'll come back to that at the end of this slide, depends on E squared. So let's just take this form of the, polar, uh, form of the polarization. Just take a very generic electrical field written as a sine wave. I substitute it in, and I see that there's a term here which oscillates at three omega, so that's going to generate what is called a third harmonic. I'm not interested in that term there. It's not doing anything useful for us. The useful bit is this one, okay? So if I plug that back in, in here, I end up with this relation, okay? The only change is that I have an absolute value squared of the electrical field, and if I, the refractive index in terms of polarization, is just the square root of one plus, so the relative uh, permittivities is one plus chi, n is the square root of that. So that's why I have one plus, and this is my effective chi. So I just put all that in here, okay? And then, uh, this is just a, a, a Taylor expansion. Typically this term here, so this one plus chi is my linear epsilon, okay? This term here is the additional bit, which is controlled by the electrical field, and this is usually much smaller than, than this term here, okay? So I can do a Taylor expansion, and I end up, I can write N, my total refractive index is some N naught, it's the background standard refractive index that we, we're, we're used to measuring, plus a delta N, okay? And this delta N is usually written as an N2, this is just how people do it, and we'll be coming back to that later on. Written as an N2, this is called the nonlinear Kerr index, okay? So this is, a linear refractive index. This is a nonlinear Kerr index times the intensity. Okay, and typically I'll have some my light pulse. So I have a pulse of light. It'll have some some envelope, and then there'll be the electrical field oscillating underneath it. Okay. Essentially, what I've done is by throwing away this term here, I've thrown away the fast oscillation, and all I'm keeping is the envelope, okay? So here, what I'm essentially doing is just looking at the envelope. And this envelope will have an intensity which depends on X and T, okay? And, oh, by the way, this is, so the N2 in terms of the chi 3 is just going to be by, by this relation. But we can essentially just you know, stick with the N2. It's an easier number, uh, easier number to use. So essentially what this is saying then is that the problem so we said the problem of creating an arbitrary space-time becomes the problem of generating an, a matching refractive index profile, which has to move at some speed on some 
form in space and time. And now I've said that that is actually reduced to the problem of controlling my light pulse and how that interacts with the material. Right, so the question. No. Okay. The, the metric is a function of x and t. It's, uh, okay, so the, the trick is what you usually do is you have, uh, let's say you have some kind of uh, material. I'm just looking from the side now. And I come in from the side with some, some pulse that will control the material. And then I can, for example, come in with another probe pulse, which is much weaker, does not participate. You know, I, I, let's call this E pump. Let's call this E, uh, e signal or something. This is just a probe wave. Now, in so the, the probe would be, so yes, exactly. So the, this, this intensity would be what I call the pump. And then this field here is what probes the refractive index profile. And in general, that probe, if I'm looking for quantum field effects, that probe foot, for example, could just simply be the vacuum. So actually, I do not send what comes in here is actually the vacuum state. And then I look at the output, and I ask myself, so I'm not sending anything in. Do I see anything coming out? And that's sort of the whole point behind these quantum field theory analogs. I've got something shaking. There's nothing going in. And then I open the box. Is there something coming out? Does someone else have a question? Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but I, I think you're saying that, there's, that the, everything's lumped in front of the dt squared, so what happens in the dx squared? Or... Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case, yes, but you can generalize, and we'll see that on Friday, you can generalize this concept example, 2D, potentially even 3D. Nobody's done 3D yet, so for dx, dy, dz. Uh, but you can, uh, I think we're the first, but you can, I'll show you, it is relatively easy to extend this to, to dy. And I'll also show you in the next slide that you can get a non-trivial dependence just by um, a Lorentz boost. You can build uh, a Schwarzschild or the equivalent of a Schwarzschild metric, even in 1D where you have terms both in front of the dt and the dx. So it can very quickly become very complicated depending, uh, depending on what you're doing, also depending on the reference state. This is a very simple, uh, sort of simplified approach, which I'm using just to sort of uh, highlight where the physics are, but you'll see it will become, will become more complicated. Me, sorry? That's correct, yeah. Uh, do, I ha do I have expressions for the curvature? Um, not in my slides, not explicitly. But, but yeah, we, we can talk, uh, talk about that, yes. Okay. So, um, as I was pointing out then, so the common feature in all of these systems and even in the BC systems, the other systems that, we're, that people have been looking at, the, the details of how you control the polarization or something equivalent to the polarization in the material, essentially all, it all boils down to the fact you have some control field or some pump, pulse, whatever that might be, that is, that is modifying the medium, and that is what creates the space-time. Okay, so an example. How do we create a space-time with the horizon? We'll be talking about this in more detail tomorrow. Um, what I have in mind, and this was originally proposed by, um, by Orf Leonhardt in a science paper in 2009. Uh, you can 
think of just taking an optical pulse and sending it down an optical fiber, okay? So your intensity will indeed be a function of X minus uh, VT. You can, we can go back, this is exactly the metric that I was mentioning earlier on. We can perform a Lorentz boost, for example, okay, and go into the co-moving. So the, the key is that many of these analogs, not all of them, but many of these analogs work in the co-moving reference frame, okay? And this is the key point with light, and it's the key difference between, for example, a Bose-Einstein condensate analog and a, a, an optics analog. The Bose-Einstein condensate is sitting still in the lab, and that's the reference frame in which it works. The most of the, but not all of them, I underline, but most of the optical analogs work in the co-moving frame. So if I take this metric and do a Lorentz boost, this is the ugly expression that I get back, but... The point is, uh, if you look here, so this is the dt squared term. There's a mixed dt dx, and there's a dx term. So you can see the metric is already very quickly becoming a lot more complicated. You've got all your dx, dtx, and so on terms in there. It's still 1d in spatially because we're propagating down, down the fiber. Okay? So if I look here, I can see that I can identify the fact that I have an ergosphere where the g naught naught is equal to 0. That's equivalent to, to this. So this n, this is an x minus vt. But you can see this refractive index is, is in there. But because we're in 1D, that ergosphere actually corresponds to a horizon, and it corresponds to this horizon from this condition here, okay? Where this delta n, so this is just the background refractive index, and this delta n is the, the refractive index change induced by, by my laser pulse. None other than, than what I mentioned uh, earlier on. None, really. It's, it's very generic. But what conditions were you thinking of? Is there some? Some, sorry? No? So there's no, there's no, no assumption other than that we just have a light pulse which is propagating down a fiber, and we've just taken the wave equation and you pull out this, I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing else in there. So it's very generic. Okay. And sure. So, and, and the chi-3. And there's, there's some kind of change in the refractive index which acts through, through a chi-3. And I'm throwing away the fast oscillation terms and just looking at the envelope. Okay. I3 is how I generate the refractive index, yes. Yeah, it never actually, it doesn't explicitly appear in there other than, than through this, this delta lenta. So what that thing means is that I've got this light pulse which is moving down the fiber. In his reference frame, so this is, I'm sitting here essentially, looking at what's happening. There will be a series of horizons actually all along sort of different points here, okay? So I think I've got this on the slide, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll, let's not go there for the moment, because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, we'll talk about this in more detail tomorrow. But essentially, the point is that on your pulse, there'll be a point here where an approaching probe wave, as it comes in, it gets slowed down, right? Because the refractive index is increasing. The speed of this guy is C divided by N. But n is increasing here, so let me put n on this, on this uh, axis here. Okay, so this comes in, as it approaches, it slows down, slows down, slows down, and if you tune things properly, it will stop. Okay, and it won't be able to get inside. Now that doesn't look like a black hole, that's because it's not. This is what people call a white hole. Okay, so it's just the temporal reverse of uh, of a black hole. So everything gets sucked in a black hole and can't get out. In a white hole, nothing can get, everything is thrown out and nothing can get in. Okay? So if I have, but if I have a white hole over here, I'll have a black hole over here, but it's actually the opposite. Uh, the, the opposite of this. Okay? We're discarding these, sorry?
uh, so that comes in down here. So we're, we're not we're considering everything. And that is exactly the, it's, it's, that's exactly what you should do. If you want to analyze what the Hawking radiation looks like, you need to, what will happen is you'll come in and, well, so strictly speaking, there will only be a reflection if, uh, we'll come to go into more detail on this tomorrow, if there's dispersion. But if, if the, the, the refractive index does not depend on frequency, then actually you will come in here and other than mode conversion effects due to Hawking-like uh, radiation, there won't be any reflection. Okay, this is just a very smooth transition. And don't think of it like a hard-edged piece of glass where indeed you do have reflection. It's a smooth adiabatic transition towards a point where this wave essentially gets compressed and squeezed in and then remains there blocked. Principle. Then what really happens is actually something different. So you need to pull in the whole dispersion of the material, and you also need to consider the, this Hawking mode conversion process. You'll have conversion into different modes, you'll, and you'll get conversion into a positive and a negative frequency mode, one of which can be reflected out. So we will look at that tomorrow. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's give a couple of examples of. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So you, you have, uh, so the idea is that you have some piece of fiber, okay? You send in a light pulse, which propagates down the fiber. And this is in the lab frame. This is what I was uh, doing the tutorial yesterday. We saw, I think there's atoms going back and forth along a fiber you're showing us. But that, that was, that's kind of what you would see in the lab frame. But if you go in the, what, this T prime, X prime frame that I'm talking about here, is a reference frame which is rigidly moving. It's like sitting on top of the, uh, the soliton or the light pulse and moving along with it. It's a co-moving frame. And essentially, there are only two frames that make sense here. There's the lab frame, or there's the frame moving at the same constant speed of, the, of your e, e squared pulse. Okay? Does that make sense? So, I want to very, so we will, we will go into more detail about this uh, tomorrow. Um, so let's consider a slightly simpler case where let's forget X and just consider uh, a homogeneous, a spatially homogeneous time-bearing metric. Okay? So now my metric is just, this has N squared of T. There's no X in there. X, Y, or Z, and it's uniform in all dimensions. Um, Maxwell's equations are conformally invariant, which essentially means that I, I'm allowed to pull the n squared up in front of the dx term, or in this case, dz, because it's only one spatial coordinate, so it doesn't really matter what I use. And then I can start playing around and ask myself, well, you know, what kind of space-time metrics can I study with something like this? So, for example, I can take an exponential dependence of the refractive index, and claim that maybe I have something like, or in general, it doesn't have to be that specific form, but I can, for example, uh, look at expanding universe or so-called Friedman, Robertson, Walker metrics, okay, which are exactly of this form here. Uh, I could also take a cosine t, and then I would have something similar to this dynamical Casimir effect that I mentioned earlier on. I have something oscillating in time, okay? But we've also shown and I'll very briefly, I won't go into any detail, but I'll show you this can also be used to mimic some kind of metric induced by a gravitational effect. How do we do this? What would the physical system look like? Well, what we came up with is probably the best way to do this is to take, for example, a very thin film of material. When I say very thin, I mean really thin. So, for example, graphene, monatomic layer of material. Okay? And I send in, whoops, and I send in uh, a light pulse. And I will create an N of T. If the light pulse is very broad, this will be spatially uniform. And this film will essentially just see the refractive index go up, okay? or at least on the leading edge. So it will go up and then come back down again. But it's the going up, sort of this N of this increasing N of T, which mimics the expanding, expanding universe. 
okay? So, for example, only one edge, so the, the film is so thin, essentially it only sees, it sort of locally sees the refractive index uh, increase. And you can go through the details of this, and you will in, in the next slides. Uh, the emission from just one single film of graphene, you went through the numbers, although the nonlinearity of graphene is quite high, so you have relatively large scale terrains, uh, the emission is still extremely weak. So this beta squared, and I'll describe what that is now, sort of gives a measure of how many photons, directly related how many photons per second, you, you can generate it's a very small number, but most importantly, what happens is that as you, um, depending on the rise time, so I've got, for example, pulse of two femtoseconds, five femtoseconds, 20 femtoseconds, the peak emission, you see it's kind of a black body-like shape, but it has a peak which very quickly shifts towards very, very long wavelengths. Okay, this is K, so this is just the inverse of the wavelength. Uh, so here for 20 femtosecond pulse, for example, we're already at wavelengths of the order of hundreds of microns. And it's just a wavelength region which experimentally is very, very hard to access and do any measurements. In, okay? On the other hand, you could say, well, why don't you just use a two femtosecond pulse? And then you've got yourself something which is of the order of one micron where you can do measurements. But then you run into trouble because generating two femtosecond pulses typically will require uh, you generating something which is a single cycle or even sub-cycle, and that is also extremely hard. So you're in, in kind of between a hard place, a rock and a hard place here. It's, there's no, it's hard, okay? So that's why these effects are not readily observable and have never been seen before. Uh, we can try, I should mention that if, you know, this N of T, I could make it like a cosine function, so it just oscillates in time. And then I could have, I could, should expect to see some kind of resonant enhancement due to this periodic oscillation. Okay? One way of doing this, instead of sending in one pulse, send in a train of pulses. Sorry? Oh, DC, sorry, dynamical Casimir effect. Okay. <laughs> I probably wrote it DC because it didn't fit in the slide. Okay? So, one way to do this is just to send in uh, a train of pulses, okay, with some given periodicity. And if you go through the numbers again, through the equations, which we will see in, in a moment, you can see this is sort of the black body-like shape that I was showing you in the previous slides, multiplied by 100 now. This is what I get with a, just a single variation. If I put in three variations now, I see the sync-like pattern. Notice that this is essentially already 100 times larger than this. Even if I only have three it's not, you know, it's not like a perfect sine wave. I've only put in three humps here, and it's already 100 times stronger. But if I put in five, you see it starts to narrow in, becomes more peaked, but just keeps on becoming larger and larger due to this resonance enhancement. And this is the kind of dynamical Casimir effect that was verified in the superconducting qubit system that I mentioned earlier on uh, in Per Delsing's experiment. Uh, in terms of you know, how does it behave like a gravitational wave? Well, if I take the metric for this, so I've got my delta n, which is now a uh, cosine function, it actually looks very much like the metric for a gravitational wave. There's a square missing here. Okay. Uh, there is a big difference in kind of an hand wave approximation that we have to make here that the gravitational wave metric is a quadrupole metric, not a dipole. But if we were to just fix, just look at one, uh, at one axis, and we can see, I mean, there's a clear similarity uh, between the two, and you can look at the speed with which things are changing, for example, and you can sort of approximate this, both metrics in the same way and get essentially exactly the same result. So I don't want to go into the details of, of this, uh, but I, what I want to do is to try and go into an example where I want to be a bit more quantitative. But I will take this for today at least, this purely time-varying, spatially homogeneous case as our sort of our, as our study case. Now, the first thing I want to show, so there are two key features here that I want to, I will have time to, I might not have time to go into the full detail of the, the experiments we're doing, but I think the important thing is these two things here, because this lies at the basis of literally everything 
Hawking radiation or any quantum field theory effect in the space-time bearing background comes out of this. So the first claim is that a time varying medium leads to time dependent frequency of any propagating rays. Okay? If you want to focus on particles with mass rather than photons, then just put in uh, the energy of your particles there, and the result is the same. The corollary to this is that a time dependent frequency, so a time varying medium gives me a time dependent frequency or time dependent energy. The key point is that a time-dependent frequency or energy imply, always has to imply particle, or in our case, photon production, period. That, that, I mean, if you want, you can forget everything I said before. You can forget everything I said uh, I'll be saying in the next two days. Just remember this slide here, okay? So what I want to do is, in a very hand-waving, there'll, there'll be a little bit of maths, but as I said, I'm not a theoretician, so it's going to be bad maths. But I'm going to try and show you why these, especially this bit here, is, it doesn't look obvious, but it's just as obvious, and it should be taken for granted exactly the same way that a piece of, when you send in some light onto a piece of glass, where you have a space dependence instead of a time dependence, you will always expect a reflection, okay? And I'll show you that for exactly the, exactly the same reasons. You also, this spatial, this reflection in the, in the case of a spatially dependent medium, in, in the case of a time dependent medium, the reflection becomes particle production. Okay? Okay, so let's start off with showing that a time varying medium leads to time dependent frequency or time dependent energy. I'm talking about optics, so I'll just focus again on photons. So we have, this is the normal case that we're all familiar with. I have a spatial boundary, so I'm showing space here, and this, let's say this is vacuum, this is air, and here this could be a piece of glass. Okay, and we all know that when you transition, that the beam comes in a certain k vector k1 and frequency omega, inside the medium, its k vector will change, it will be refracted, going to an angle, but the omega stays constant. In the other case, we, now we have a time boundary. Okay, so this axis now, so you have to think of something which is spatially unit. But in time, I'm changing its refractive index. So at time zero, it's at some refractive index. And then I, everywhere, so imagine this whole room, I suddenly increase the refractive index to two. Okay? That's what's going on here. Now, the k vectors will not change. There will be no, there's nothing to diffract or refract from. There's no, inter, there's no spatial interface. So the k vectors are conserved. But on the other hand, what I'm saying is that frequency will change, okay? So the light, the, the frequency, the colors of these lights, if I were to increase, suddenly increase the fractal index of the air from one to two, you'd see all the colors the, 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 from, emitted from these projectors, for example, they would change. So how do I show that? There's a very simple way of showing this. Um, oh, by the way, so this, uh, if you're in more interested more to this, this is what is often called also time refraction. There's lots of uh, papers by uh, Pietro Mendonca and co-workers. The key word to Google is time refraction. He also has a very nice book called uh, Photon Acceleration. Okay? And the whole idea is that by changing the refractive index, the photons kind of get accelerated or decelerated. The, yes, the wavelength does, sure. But here I'm talking, so the cave, also talking about why the K vector is constant. I'm talking about the fact, not the vacuum K vector, I'm talking about the material K vector, the fact that it changes angle. So it won't change, it will keep on propagating in the same direction. That's what I'm referring to there. Because in the K vector, you also have the refractive index, so it cancels out. So the K vector does not change. The wavelength changes, but the K vector, they're, they're not the same thing, right? So the K vector is, has a net refractive index in there, and that cancels out. So although the wavelength can change, the K vector doesn't. Huh? Okay. So, I mean, so very brief. I mean, so this hand-waving sort of derivation is, is, I'd say, adapted. It's not exactly the same derivation that you can 
find the mineral in this book, but it's, it's kind of inspired by that. So let's just take a generic wave, okay? It's got an amplitude, it's got a phase. I'm going to write the phase as we always do, as kz minus omega t, minus omega t. And the k vector can be pulled out generically from the phase. It's just the, the gradient of the phase with respect to z, okay? And omega, likewise, is, I can just say it's just minus, there's a minus sign here, minus the gradient of the phase with respect to t, okay? So what I'm interested in showing is that when I have a time-varying medium, k does not change in time. So what I'm trying to evaluate is the dk and dt. So I can write the dk and dt as the d and dt of my, just use the definition here, of the d phi and dz. Then I switch the dt and the dz, and I use this definition here. So I, I have that the dk and dt is essentially equal to minus the omega and dz. Okay? So now let's have a look again at this. So the dk minus and dt, I said it's minus the omega and dz. But using this relation, this is why I said that you, know, you have to be careful. You have to pull in the refractive index into your definitions here. So I write omega as kc divided by n. So I put that in here. And essentially, I can pull out the omega. Uh, well, I, I, I do the, put that in there and do the gradient. And I end up with omega divided by n uh, times dn and dz. Okay? But I said that the thing, this material, the system I'm looking at is spatially uniform. So there is no d, dn and dz. And that's, that's precisely the starting point of my system. So this is a pure n of t. There's no z dependence. So this has to be equal to 0. And so then this immediately tells me that my dk and dt, answering your question, cannot, the k cup is equal to zero, so the k does not change. I have spatial uniformity, change everything in time. This simple calculation tells you that, k, that dk and dt is equal to zero. If I go and do the same kind of calculation with the omega and dt, okay, so exactly the same thing. I end up with an omega over n, dn and dt minus d omega and dr. And again, this term is equal to zero because I have spatial uniformity. I'm just left with this term. This should have been a z. Uh, I end up with this term here. You can see that now the d omega and dt is actually equal to my, well, there's an omega over n, but essentially is given by my dn and dt. There's nothing quantum here, no. Okay, yeah. This is just classical, it's all classical optics. Okay. So there are people who are now trying to use this effect to actually create new photonic kind of devices for fiber optic telecommunication systems. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that in a spatially uniform material, the K does not change but the omega does. And this is the exact opposite of what you have in a spatially varying system that's just constant in time and density. Yeah, that's, that's true. It depends, so, so it, it, it all, so it depends what you're doing, okay? So you're, you're right. You went and took a very, you, you made a very specific choice for your wave and of your material. So you, the choice you made was... You decided that the E squared term was like this, for example, okay? And then you also decided that your material was some sort of slab or fiber, which is at least as long as one oscillation, but let's say like many oscillations, okay? Sure, but in this case, you, the, the refractive index perturbation that I have in here is of the form, 
uh, probably I'd write it as a Z minus VT. Okay, but that's not what I'm considering here. And, and, and it's, it's some, something very valid, something that you can certainly do. And then, but then you have to ask yourself, what is the space-time metric that I'm mimicking with this? Remember, my whole point, the first point of this, of today's lecture was, the message I was trying to drive home was, you want a metric, from that, decide what your refractive index perturbation should be, and then from that, decide what your pulse profile, combined with the material, this was some of the examples I was giving you, combined with the material should look like. You can also do the opposite. You say, I've got a certain material, you made a choice, I've got a certain material, and this is the pulse or the, 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 the pump beam that I want to use. Well, then you are, have to ask yourself, what is the, DS, what is the metric that I'm, I'm mimicking? Okay? In this case, I can tell you that it is not something that's sort of this spatially, whatever that means, but it's not something that depends only on time. It's not spatially unit. So if I wanted to make this into, if I was really, you know, bent on, so this is the pulse I have and this is what I have to live with, how do I make it into something that's described by this? Well, the, what I, one thing you could do is, for example, and this is, you saw this a moment ago, I could take a very, a very thin slab of material. Okay, and now you can see that this would be an N of T, which goes up and down, so it's, it would be proportional to some, your cosine wave. Okay, it would be oscillating up and down in time. So now I've retrieved, by doing this, I've retrieved the spatial uniformity and I've kept just the N of T. Okay? So th this is, it's a combination of the pulse and the material that you have to, that you have to choose. Okay? And indeed, we'll, if we have time, we'll be, I'll be showing you a system where we achieve this kind of N of T precisely by choosing something which is a very thin material. Okay? Because alternative, alternatively, you can have a very thick material, but then I have to ensure that this is, sort of has this shape. But even then, I have to make sure that my material can be thicker, but it can't be thicker than the pulse, otherwise I end up in, in again, if I have something which is like this, then I end up again with something which is a function of Z minus V. So it's, there's a lot of flexibility, and you have to use this flexibility to build the metric that you want. And the flexibility is in terms of the shape, the specific shape of the pulse, but also the specific shape of the material. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So um, I demonstrated the first of the two sentences that I wrote uh, on my slide. So omega changes in a time-bearing medium. Okay, so the second and probably the more important bit, a time-dependent frequency implies particle or photon production, always. Okay, there are only very specific situations in which this doesn't happen, but they are very sort of, they're, they're, they're quirks, they're not sort of the norm. So rephrased, a quantum harmonic oscillator, for example, with a time-dependent frequency necessarily produces particles. Okay, and this is where Sort of more, the more quantum aspect uh, comes into play. And this, as I said, is a very standard result of quantum field theory. It's the same effect that lies at the basis of cosmological particle production. Okay? So, but we believe, or one of the, at least part of the inflammationary model, tells us that the inhomogeneities in our current universe, so the reason, very reason that we have a galaxy, and therefore the very reason that we are here, existence of life itself, all arise from the fact that during this inflationary period, we have this, this inflaton field, and quantum fluctuations in the inflaton field were expanded by this, or sort of created real particles, if you want, or uh, excitations through this exponential expansion that we had during the inflationary phase, and that gave rise to inhomogeneities in primordial universe, which then seeded the existence of galaxies. Okay? Uh, it also lies at the base of the dynamic of Casimir effect, Hawking radiation, Andrew radiation, etc., etc., and so on. Okay? This is sort of the overlying principle of all of this. Okay, so let's, how does this work? Well, 
Let's just start from the harmonic oscillator. It's the simplest possible uh, system, okay? I always say that if you can understand harmonic oscillators, then you've understood essentially 99% of physics. So let's just take the harmonic oscillator qu uh, equation, but now let's put in a frequency, de a, a time dependence in the frequency, okay? Or even simpler, I mean, what I want to do is I want to show you, just go over very briefly what happens in the space dependent case and then show you how things change when you go into the time dependent case. So let's just use sort of a textbook example where this term here is actually a knee, so the energy of your system minus V, you have this spatial, spatially dependent potential V of X, okay? This is a very well understood problem. Let's just assume for the moment that E is greater than V of X and that the V is, is our potential has some kind of, uh, it's limited, okay? So it goes to zero for small and large X, okay? So for large X, that means X minus or plus infinity, essentially the V disappears and this is our uh, harmonic oscillator. So that equation has very simple solutions. I have forwards and backwards propagating waves. I can just write as e to the plus or minus i square root e of x. Okay, it's just plain waves. At large distances, the solution is therefore given. So this is my potential changing somewhere in the middle. But at very large distances, so minus infinity, I can write as the sum of incoming and outcoming waves. And likewise, plus infinity, there will be incoming and outgoing waves in general, okay? So this is just combinations of solutions moving to the right, the plus size, and to the left, with the minus size, okay? But I'm, what I'm assuming here is that I have, draw, I think I've got a picture on the next slide, but let's just redraw it here. So I have some kind of potential here. I have a wave coming in, okay? And what I expect is a wave coming, these waves coming out. In other words, what I'm saying is that I only expect a right-going mode at the output, okay? I don't expect at the output a mode coming in if I'm only coming in from over here. If this guy doesn't, I can cancel him and just simplify to this situation here, okay? And then I'm going to rename V divided by A. I'm going to call that R, reflectivity, because that's, that is what reflectivity is, okay? So A is what is coming in and B is what is coming out. The ratio is what I call reflectivity. And likewise at the output. So this is, this is A coming in, this is B coming out, and this is C coming out. Okay? So clearly also I'd call the C divided, where are we here? The C divided by A is what I'd call the transmission. Okay? And so I rewrite everything like this. So I'm just normalizing the input. I'm just calling the input one, and then I have, have this relation here. Okay? So, and this is the picture that I was drawing, drawing over here. A coming in, B, or reflection, coming out, and the transmission coming out in my private button. Okay, so let's just do some renaming and just call, for example, E minus Vx, I could call it an omega squared of x, okay? And now I can just take things one step further. As I said, this is very sloppy maths, but I just want to build very into what's going on here. Let's take one st things one step further, and instead of omega of x, well, let me exchange x with minus t. Okay, I'm doing that because this, remember how we wrote the phase. It was kx minus omega t. Okay? So I can flip, I can change x with minus t. Get it exactly, and nothing's really changing. This also means, though, that the, the and so this is why I'm just pointing out the sort of correspondence between plus kx and minus omega t. And now the positive or the right moving frequency modes are the ones with minus omega t, okay? As you'd expect, a, a, a wave with this kind of phase is as a plus in front of the x term or minus in front of the temporal phase term and is moving forwards in that direction, okay? So these are what I would call the positive frequency terms and if I have a plus i omega t, is what I, this is what I would call the negative frequency term. Okay? So this is what my equation looks like. I've just substituted omega of x with omega of t. Now, the solutions to this equation are just by analogy with what I said before. 
and now this. And you've noticed I've, I've flipped things. I've, well, I've changed the uh, square root of e times x into omega t's, of course, because that's what I said I would do. But I, I, don't ha I have two terms over here and only one term over here. Now, why is that? So I put the a equal to 0 and kept c and d. So now what I've done is I have, so I, I put this to 0, not the a. The, it's not important. I put the, the reflected term here to 0, and I've kept, I've kept this guy. Okay. So why is that? Well, you have to think of, you know, we're in time now. So this, this term here would have corresponded to something propagating to minus infinity without me ever having sent something in, and that's not cow's I can't, I can't have that. Okay? So that's why I'm saying so. I cannot expect solutions that propagate backwards in time towards the input. Okay? And this is the key difference in passing from x to t. We'll come back to this in a moment. But this lies at the basis of the whole photon production mechanism. And it's the difference between space and time. Space, you can go backwards and forwards to minus and plus infinity. There's no problems in you doing that. With time, we have this very annoying arrow of time, which only goes in one direction. And that breaks the whole symmetry of the problem. Okay? And in doing so, it, enforces, it forces you to make a choice here, which then leads, we'll go through the next steps, does unavoidably lead to the fact that you have to have photon pair production. And there's no escape. And it all stems from this. Okay? So I'm going to do, as before, I'm just going to normalize the, uh, the input condition. Okay? And just rename things. Um, I've just put, so I've put one here, and I've got these two coefficients, alpha and beta. These are what are called the Bogolyubov coefficients. Okay? They're very ubiquitous. You'll find them all over the place. Uh, yes, I think this is a, this is because I made a mistake here. As I pointed out, this is, I should be keeping the A term here. So I think this, this is the correct one. Yeah, there's, there's a mistake here. Okay. okay. So this is the system that I'm, I'm considering. I'm coming in again. This mistake, this should be the A. And then I've got, uh, I've got something going out. I am allowed, of course, something from plus infinity to come in in time to come in towards, uh, towards the potential. So in terms of my transmission and reflection coefficients that I used in the spatial case, uh, just by analogy, you can see that the, the alpha, there is it, the alpha and the beta here, the alpha is given by 1 over t and the beta is given by r over t. Okay? So... If I just take the standard scattering relation, just conservation of energy, essentially, okay? R squared plus T squared has to be equal to one, but now I rewrite it in terms of these alpha, these new alpha and beta coefficients. Well, what I get is that beta squared has to be, it's R squared over T squared, that's how it's defined, it will just be one over T squared minus one. But what that means is that alpha squared minus beta squared is now equal to one. I've, I, I started off in the spatial case, I have an R squared plus T squared equals 1. But now in the temporal case, I have an alpha squared minus beta squared equals 1. Okay? So, in other words, what I'm saying is that beta squared greater than 0 is just identical to saying, if you look at this relation here, it's just identical to saying that the transmissivity is less than 1 which is always the case, right? You hit a piece of glass, you come in with one, and you'll get out 0 0.96 or whatever it is. That's, that's how it has to be. And so you can also read this the other, or I'll have reflectivity, which is greater than zero. I'll have a 4% reflection, always have a reflection, okay? So in other words, if I'm happy that in a standard spatial thing where I just have a piece of glass, things are changing in space, but are constant in time, if I'm happy and comfortable with the fact that R is greater than zero or T is less than one in that case, then it, for exactly the same reasons, I have to have beta greater than zero in the temporal case. Okay? But take a look at this relation. So if I say that beta is greater than zero, then in order to keep on having one here, so energy conservation, that means that alpha also has to keep 
greater, has to increase. Okay? So what I'm saying is that in the temporal case, the analog of a spatial reflection actually becomes amplification. Okay? I have to have beta greater than zero. But beta greater than zero means I also have to increase this coefficient here. So all my scattering products actually increasing. I come in with one, and anything I get out has to be greater than what I sent in. So I have to have amplification, and this is the key point. So I, if I have an amplifier, and this is actually also a quantum amplifier, then it can amplify anything. If I give it noise, it will amplify noise. If I give it quantum fluctuations, it will amplify the quantum fluctuations and give you particle flow. Okay? And there's nothing in here that has anything to do in reality with photons. It could equally be particles with mass. Okay? Good. Okay. So, reflection occurs as a space boundary in the temporal analog of this. So, the temporal analog of R being reflectivity being greater than zero is that beta is greater than zero. And the key relation is this guy here. Okay. So, Summarizing, this means that the classical solution contains the output, contains this negative frequency term, simply due to the fact that omega is a function of time. And we can also show that this does imply particle creation. So I can create, I can write out, I'll, I'll skip this through this very quickly because I did want to show you an example of how all this works. Um, I can write down the, the classical time dependent. Hamiltonian for, the, for the, the oscillator. Let's just, for the moment, take a fixed frequency. So I'm sort of throwing away the time dependence. Fixing the frequency. And this is my Hamiltonian. Uh, these are the A and the A dagger terms. Okay? And I can find the total energy. Let's take the expectation value. And I find this is just like the standard result. Okay? Where this is the number of particles. And this is the vacuum Okay? In the time-dependent case, the, the key point is I can't simply say, oh, okay, let's just put a T here. So this will be my, uh, my time-dependent expectation value for the Hamiltonian. That doesn't work. And the ground state is not this guy. Okay? So what I'm saying is, you know, when I was looking at this, if I'm saying that if, when you go back and forth, so from this potential to this potential, you, you do not simply conserve the number of photons. You just change the frequency. That is not what happens, okay? Uh, what happens is, and you can look at this differently in different ways, but you can take, for example, you can generalize the Dirac approach to solving uh, the, the Hamiltonian problem in the time-independent case. So he wrote this, uh, this, Q, this sort of Q operator as a sum of A and A daggers, uh, impose these solutions, and essentially he arrives at this, he imposes this equation here for the V, and finds this plane wave, norm, properly normalized plane wave solution with constant omega. Uh, you can do the same thing, exactly the same thing in the time dependent case. Your equation of motion becomes this guy now, so there's a frequency dependent omega, but we've already solved this. I just listed this in the previous slides. We know that for very early times at t minus infinity, you have an input uh, plane wave and at the output, you have the sum of these two waves here, one with an alpha coefficient, so the positive frequency with an alpha coefficient and the negative frequency term with a beta coefficient. Okay? We already solved this. So then I can just plug this in. I can then just calculate what the expectation value is for the Hamiltonian, and I end up with this formula here. I don't have an n here anymore. I have beta squared. And that's the key point. Okay? There's a mistake here. There should be v dot, which is the time derivative of, uh, of v. Okay? So now let's go and compare things. So this was my input state, n plus one half omega, with n equals zero if I want to input a vacuum state. It doesn't have to be, but if I want to input the vacuum state, then I take this with n equals zero. At the output, this is what I'll have. I have beta squared plus one. Okay, so in other words, I can, just by looking at these two, I just identify this beta, the beta squared is essentially the number of photons that I see at the output. And I will see photons at the output because beta squared has to be greater than zero. Okay, we've already pointed this out. Even if at the input I have nothing, I have no photons, n equals zero. Okay, so summarizing, a time-dependent time dependent frequency transforms 
my forward positive frequency mode into a combination of positive and negative frequency modes. I always have a non-zero beta, so I always have, I always end up populating my negative frequency modes. And as a result of this, an input vacuum state ends up being populated or excited at the output state. Okay? Okay, so if the recipe for calculating, this is like the standard trick and approach used in QFT, yes? Does that mean, sorry, beta? Um, it's, it's not a, so there it's not an integer, so the number of photons would be, be it, it's, no, beta in general is not an integer. It's not an integer. Sorry? Or beta squared, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make any difference, but uh, the, I mean, you, typically you, you, you won't be looking, and I guess it could be, I mean, you might end up with one or two, but in general, you yes, it's an average number. So it doesn't mean that every single event you'll have that number of photons. It means an average number. Um, any quantum amplifier has to add yes. In, uh, yes, or said alternatively, any amplifier will also amplify the, the quantum vacuum. So if you want, a black hole is essentially just an amplifier or vacuum. That, that's the trick. Okay. Okay, so the standard trick in QFT, when you have some kind of time, time dependence for calculating what happens is, first you define the system by finding its evolution equation. In my example, I was using the harmonic oscillator. It might not be that. It might be the Klein-Gordon equation. It, it, it can be what you want. It, if the system has, you have to identify what the evolution equation is for your system. You take an input condition, okay, it's just a plane wave, then you evolve it, so this is what your, your solution at minus infinity, where nothing's changing in time. You evolve it through your evolution equation F, and then you try to express the output as a sum of alpha and beta coefficients. So just project, you'll get something at the output from your numerical, you might have to do this numerically, so take a numerical simulation, just project it onto these positive and negative frequency states. And the key is you find in doing this, you pull out what the beta coefficient is. Okay? And then you use the beta coefficient to calculate the actual photon number. I won't go through a derivation of this, but essentially this is the total number of photons per unit volume is given by this interval. You have to integrate over all, all the k values. Okay? So... I have five minutes, maybe? Can I steal another five minutes? I, I just want to very quickly, if you are interested in this, maybe we can use some of the tutorial time to look at it into more detail. But I do have a worked out example, something that we're working on right now in the lab to try and demonstrate uh, that you can have photon pair production from a time varying medium. And the key point is that this time variation needs, on the one hand, it needs to be fast, and on the other hand, it needs to, be, needs to be large, okay? Remember, I said earlier on it needs to be fast because the peak emission scales roughly as one over the time variation. So slow variations tend to shift emission all the way down into the far infrared or microwave region where we can't do measurements at the single photon level, okay? So we want it to be very fast. Um, it also needs to be large uh, because if you know, the perturbation is tiny, then you'll also get a tiny beta at the output in the same way that a, a, a small refractive index change will give you a very weak reflection. Here, a very small refractive index change will give you very low particle production. So you need these two conditions to be verified. And what we've been looking at is like a new generation of materials which have emerged just over the past couple of years, and they're characterized by the fact that the real part of the dielectric permittivity goes to zero. Okay, this is very weird. Well, what essentially what it means is that you, you have, some, have materials that have a refractive index which is extremely small, can be very close to zero. Okay? And that's weird because if you think of a piece of, a piece of glass has a refractive index 1.5, but 
the vacuum has a factor index one. And here I'm talking about materials that have a factor index of the order of 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. Extremely low effective indices. And what does that even mean? I mean, if you think of terms of the phase, phase velocity, C divided by N, it means they become superluminal. Okay, so weird materials. And they're actually much more commonplace than you think. ITO, indium tin oxide, is what is on your, on your phone screens. Okay? And ITO is one of these kinds of materials that has this property. It's not that weird a property. There are other examples. For example, plasmas. If you take the epsilon, the electric of the plasma, you can see that when you approach or when you're exactly at the plasma frequency, then epsilon is equal to zero also for plasma. Also in waveguides, close to cutoff. This is the fact that the, the, the electric permittivity of a waveguide, and you can see that if I choose the cutoff for the T0 mode that has this frequency, and plug that into here, again, the epsilon becomes equal to zero. And what we're looking at is these materials, so ITO, there's this, this a whole sort of family of what are called transparent conductive oxides. So ITO, AZO, GZO, and so on. So here you see the oxide, and then the indium tin part is what is giving you the semiconductor semiconductor behavior. And we published a paper earlier this year where we were looking precisely at sort of non-linearly induced effective index change in these materials. Um, so I think I'll just show you a little bit about the material and then maybe during the tutorial we can look into more detail exactly how, how this works. But we measured the epsilon, so this is the imaginary part, relatively constant in wavelength and small, and this is the real part. It has a zero at about 1300 uh, nanometers. And if I go and look at, if you, I don't, you probably don't remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. So should I stop here and just continue in the tutorial in this part? Yeah, sure. So we'll continue this during the tutorial then because it's like an example of how to work out exactly what's happening here. Thank you. Sure. It's another way of looking at the same thing, yes. Yeah, so I'm ignoring the chi-3, and I'm just assuming that my refractive index is changing for some reason, although, of course, I know the underlying physics. There is, <clears throat> there is one way to doing this, though, and people have started looking into this. You can build what is called the Hopfield model. So in the Hopfield model, you model, you, you have a quantized field which interacts with a quantized medium. And you physically quantize, you, you treat the medium as a set of quantized oscillators. Okay, and that's, that has been done for just a lossless standard material uh, without any nonlinearity. But it can be, it has been generalized to include materials that have loss, so damped oscillators. But then you can also include nonlinearity into the oscillators. And that has been done, I think, in one paper, uh, precisely trying to look at the Hawking, the Hawking effect. And so in this, in this case, you do actually end up with a, a model where you've quantized the field and the medium, and you haven't made any assumption on the time dependence. It's built into the, the, the nonlinear response of the harmonic oscillator. So the harmonic oscillator has an additional uh, cube term uh, that, models, that models this. So it can be done. It's not easy. So the, the, I mean, this is, boils down to the essence of why it's so hard to, to include the whole nonlinearity, Abinita, as you, you were pointing out. So the, the, the concept of photon, and which is kind of related to your question, is only defined, well defined, at minus infinity and at plus infinity. In the middle, where things are changing in time, you're not allowed to define what a photon is. You're not allowed to say, this is n, this is the number of photons. You can't do that because... It doesn't work, and you're just, you're, just, you're just not allowed to. So the answer is not really. No, I mean, there is a conserved quantity, which is the Vonsky. Uh, so you could start from there if you wanted to find a commutative relation. But in general, the number of photons in the middle, this is, you know, this is why the whole, the, the, the whole problem is usually analyzed in terms of a scattering problem. You know what happens at minus infinity. You know what happens at plus infinity. In the middle, 
you just have to evolve through your equation and not ask too many questions. <laughs> and then compare the output with the input and, see, and find your beta.